And we're going to be talking about the, uh, the signs of the time and the end of the age. So if I can pray for this word. So Lord, we thank you, Father. We thank you for the, for the walk through the gospel of Mark. We are so grateful for this gospel message. Lord, I pray as we move into chapter 13, as we move deep into the, the signs of the end times and the reality of what's to come, I pray that, that we, take, we take courage, that we're emboldened yeah. by the promises that you've made. Yes. So Lord, we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, you know, the one thing the Lord put on my heart is that the end of these times signal the beginning of the best of times. A lot of people, a lot of churches, a lot of pet don't want to talk about the end times. And if you're not aware of it, it can, bring, it can bring some uncertainty. But through truth and scripture, it's going, to, it's going to show you that these times that we're living in, no matter what season, how well it is, it compares nothing to what's to come. You see, we're seeing the end times, the events unfold. But what it should be, it should be a reminder for you to rely on Jesus as your source of peace and faith and strength. What I will tell you, that if you walk into the furnace with any other little G God other than the God, Amen. you're walking in there alone. Amen. These end times are coming, and it should be a source of joy for the church. Yes. So if we can stand together, and let's read the anchor scripture together. And this is from Mark 13, 3, 4, and let's read together, begin, the signs of the times and the end of the age. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? Thank you, Lord, for that word. Thank you for that word. So what I want to share is last week we just... We just tipped a toe into chapter 13. We're going to be in this chapter for a while, maybe till the end of the year. It is that important and is that steeped in end time prophecy. Amen. You know, people ask, are we in the end times? And I will tell you, yes. Every second that ticks by, we are one second closer to the end times. Is that bad? No. Well, not if you're a believer. This is what we're living for. We are living for eternal life with God. Now, for non-believers, this is why it is so important for us to leave no one behind. Amen. We, as believers, should be anxiously awaiting the end of times on this earth and the beginning of the glorious life in the presence of God the Father. So what I want us to do, I want to take some time. I want to lay a foundation. We're going to talk about estacology. And, and all it means is in the Greek, it's the root word estakos, and that means last or final. And when you see ology, it's the study of, biology, anthropology. This is eschatology. And all this is, it is the study of the end times. So some of the events that we're going to look at, chapter 13 is going to cover, are things like the rapture and the tribulation and the second coming of Christ, the millennial reign, uh, the final judgment of God, new heaven and new earth. And it's like, man, that's some heavy stuff. Sticking to Scripture is going to make it less heavy. Come on. You see, there's a lot of interpretations with eschatology. There's a lot of challenges, and, and I just want to, we're going to be super transparent, because what we're looking at, we got Old Testament prophecy, we got New Testament revelation, we've got historic events that have actually happened, and we've got future events that are yet to come. So in that whole mixture, there's a lot of different um, beliefs and understandings. But what I will tell you, what we know for certain, is as believers... We will live our eternal lives with God. Amen. That is a certain. Amen. A non-believer will live an eternal life, but not with God. As believers, our hearts must be to leave no one behind. I have shared with you before that in my, my, my career, I spent 16 years in special operations. And, and our motto was, if not us, who? If we couldn't resolve that situation, there was no one else that could come in to help us. This is the charge for the church. If not us, who? Amen. You are commissioned. You have what's called in the Greek exousia. 
It is the legal commissioning, the legal authority. And Mark 16, 15, 16 tells us, And he said to them, this is Jesus, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. You have been legally commissioned. You have been legally authorized by the power of God to preach the gospel to every creature. If not you, who? So let's go back to the anchor scripture. The signs of the times and the ends of the age. 13.3 13.3 in Mark says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately. So we're going to stop right there. What the disciples are doing, they're asking Jesus about eschatology. They're asking him about the end times. So what I want to do is we're going to, we're going to spend about half of today's message teaching, understanding what is eschatology. What is the end time timeline? Because chapter 13 is telling you, y'all, this is what's coming. This is what's coming. It's important that we understand. And I need you to to have your foundation laid upon scriptural truth. So when we talk about rapture and resurrection and tribulation, so there's no misunderstanding. So what I want to start with is there's an end time timeline. And it's all based on the tribulation. Remember, the tribulation are going to be the seven years where God pours out his wrath on a wicked, rebellious world. But there's three major schools of thought that are based on the timeline as when tribulation will begin. So there's there's pre-tribulation, and that is when Jesus Jesus will claim his church in the rapture uh, before the seven years begin, before the seven years of God's wrath. Pre-trib, mid-trib, tribulation, is a belief through scripture that three and a half years into God's wrath being poured out, Jesus will resurrect his church mid-trib. And then you have post-trib, post-tribulation, where, where they believe that Jesus will resurrect his church. He will rapture the church only after we experience seven years of God's wrath on a wicked and rebellious world. Now, what I would challenge you is, if you don't have a position, and some people hold to their position, some people have changed their positions, but read the scripture and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. What I will tell you is I'm not going to give you my, my, my opinion. I'm just going to tell you that the end time timeline that I'm going to share with you, my teaching is based on a pre-tribulation doctrine. It is a, it is a belief that the Lord is going to rapture his church his beloved church, before seven years of God's wrath is poured out. So there's seven events that I want to cover. And the first is the rapture. And that's when the believers are taken up uh, to meet uh, Jesus before the tribulation. So the first, first Thessalonians, and there's a lot of scripture today. I hope that y'all are okay with a lot of scripture being read in the Lord's house. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and shall remain and be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. I believe that there's a lot of us today that will never experience physical death. I believe that we will experience the rapture of the resurrection. That is my hope. But if you pass, understand as a believer, you will be resurrected. The second act that's going to follow when we're talking eschatology is after the rapture, the resurrection is the tribulation. This is a seven-year period of God's wrath of judgment that is poured out on a wicked, rebellious earth. Matthew 24 tells us, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. Now, after those seven years, the second coming of Christ, Jesus is going to return to earth with the raptured believers. I love this scripture, and this comes from Revelation 19. Christ on a white horse. Now, now this is John. Remember, this is John writing from his revelation, the book of Revelation. Now, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. Y'all, he's talking about Jesus. 
I don't want there to be any misunderstanding. He is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written on him no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Do you all know who that is? It's you. It's you. Now, out of the mouth goes a sharp sword that with it we should strike, he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of fearness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Church, when I tell you that Jesus is not your boyfriend, when I tell you that God is a holy, reverent God to be feared, this is... This is the God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. So after the second coming of Christ begins the millennial reign. Millennial means 1,000. Begins the 1,000 year reign of Christ, of peace and righteousness on earth. Revelation 26 tells us the saints reign with Christ 1,000 years. Do you know who the saints are? You. Blessed and holy is he who was part of the first resurrection. We are part of that first resurrection. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are part of the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they, we, when he says they, he's talking about us, shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. This is why it's so important that the, we serve as an equipping church. Amen. That we know exactly what our roles are to be. Yeah. That we know what life looks like after this life. This is what life looks like after that life. Now, after the millennial reign, after the thousand years of peace, comes the final judgment. And every believer and non-believer, yeah. everybody yeah. is going to stand before God, before the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20 tells us this. Then I saw a great white throne. This is still, this is still uh, John in the Revelation. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by which things had been written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to their works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. When I say church, if not us, who? We have a legal authority to share the gospel with every creature. I want to just take a quick second because it's, oh, well, I know the book of life. You said there are other books that were open. You see, the great white throne judgment is for everybody, believers and non-believers. Now, your salvation is rock solid. You are not standing before God to judge your salvation. You will also stand before the Burma seat, which is the judgment of Christ. Now, that's not a judgment to determine your salvation. The Burma seat is only for believers. The Burma seat is where you stand before Christ and to receive your eternal reward. It's your job assignment. It's like, oh, great, you've done all these things. I'm going to put you in charge of the works department or over here and over there. These are those books that this is talking about. So I want you to understand what it's going to, what's going to happen. Not if or maybe, it's going to happen. You're a believer. You're going to stand before Christ, not for salvation judgment. Your salvation is rock solid. This is before the Burma seat to get your, uh, your eternal reward. Afterwards, we all come before God. This is the great white throne judgment. Again, your salvation is rock solid. This is to separate the lost 
from, the, from, the, from God's people. Now, after the great white throne judgment comes the new heaven and new earth. After God has separated his own from those who have refused to receive the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, we begin eternity in God's presence. This is Revelation 21. Again, this is uh, John. All things made new. Now, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was also no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Amen. You know, I've talked before about God's garden blueprint plan. When he created that design in the garden, we changed the course of that with sin and rebellion. God never changed his mind. This whole end time timeline is God's rescue plan for you. To restore us back to the intimacy of that relationship. So it's so important that we understand eschatology, the end times timeline. And try as you may or wish as you want, you can't change right. the eternal word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. This is for us to look forward to, to grow our faith in. So you're saying, great, but you left us at the, at the mount. Like Jesus is just sitting on the Mount of Olives. What does that got to do with eschatology? Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> Jesus is not just sitting on the Mount of Olives. Come on. Come on. When you read Mark 3, 13, 3, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. What I will tell you is the Mount of Olives is the bridge. It is a supernatural bridge between the natural and the spiritual realms. If you'll notice, the word sat is bolded, and that's my bold. So if you just read through Scripture thinking, well, the, you know, the reading plan says i got to read to the end of this chapter, and I, hurry, I want to get through it so I can go back and look at my TikTok. What I want to tell you is if you do that, you're going to miss the importance of words like sat. And I get it. You're like, I get it. Like, we're sitting now. Like, what's the big deal? Let me tell you what the big deal is. <clears throat> in, the, in the Greek, the word sat is kathemia. It means to be enthroned, to dwell, to reside. In the Hebrew, it's Moshe. It's enthroned. What it means is the significant, it signifies God's presence and authority. It is the act, Moshe is the act of placing someone on the throne for their installation as king, as royalty. You see the significance last week when we talked about the first part, Mark 3, 1 and 2, when the disciple was like, Man, look at that building. And Jesus is like, and Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Remember what Jesus was telling them. Y'all don't get too cuckoo crazy over the things of man. I dig it. It's a good building. But let me tell you what I've seen. This is what Jesus is teaching them. And this is why Jesus is sitting on the outside of the temple, on the Mount of Olives. You see, the things of this earth will pass away. What was once seen as the place where God resided in the man-made temple, Jesus is now establishing his throne on the outside of the temple. Why? Because the temple is going to be demolished. Why? Because Jesus' throne lasts forever. It is so important to realize that he didn't just sit on a hill. What Jesus was doing was he was actively stepping into his destiny. He is king. He is on his throne. He is Moshe. He's not just sitting on a hill. What Jesus is not doing is just sitting idly by. Come on, amen. You see, we should not pray. We should not waste precious short time. Right. People's eternal souls are at stake. We can't have a sense of entitlement where I got my insurance. I'm going to heaven. I don't know about y'all. That's not what we're commissioned to do. We're commissioned to preach the gospel to every creature. We cannot afford to sit idly by. 
this is an equipping moment. When your vision is clear and your mission is in alignment with God's will, you're going to stop wasting time. You're going to stop explaining yourself to people. You're going to stop redoing and doubting the path that God set you on. You're going to stop wondering and worrying. Oh, was that God or was that the devil? When you're in the word of the Lord and you've got the peace of the Lord and it aligns with the, with the scripture of the Lord, you know 100% that that's of the Lord. You see, you have the authority to intentionally move into your destiny. You know what wild lions don't do? They don't sit and wait for some zookeeper to snap a whip and throw a piece of meat in their mouth. Wild lions pursue their destiny. You've got to be a wild lion for the kingdom. Amen. Now, in discipleship last Monday with, with one of my brothers, and he was like, that's wild. But I want to make sure you understand that even wild lions have boundaries. The kingdom is a governance system. It doesn't mean you run amok, helter-skelter. You see, even the wildest of lions gets to the end of the continent, and he looks at the Indian Ocean and goes, well, I'll go back. We've all got boundaries. This is the word of the Lord, but those boundaries are meant to allow you to roam free and be bold and powerful. Stop waiting on, on some circus tamer to crack a whip and feed you meat. Actively, aggressively pursue God's will for your life. I want to ask you, are you pursuing your God-given dominion and authority? Are you stewarding it well? Are you just sitting on a hill? Are you just sitting on a hill? I want to share that location matters. Location matters. What does it matter where Jesus sat down? Well, I want to explain it to you. What I want to share with you right before, location matters. You see, it matters where you go to church. It matters where you go to church. And I'm not saying this to promote this church. But what I want to tell you is there's a great shaking. There's a great shaking. Because the Christian, the Western Christian world has made mega churches and celebrity pastors their idols and their gods. And unless you've been living under a rock for the last four months and you've missed the great shaking, God's purging the pulpit. That's it. Come on. And I'm telling you, you're going to have two choices. You think Tuesday's going to be a shaking? You see nothing yet. That's right. There's a shaking in the churches. These cotton candy, sugar popcorn type of feed you, feed you milk until your teeth oh, rot out. You're so weak in, the, in a weakened, watered-down gospel that you can't bite on the meat. And that you get so easily offended because you feel a little vibration. Listen, those churches, those pastors are going to go away. I'm telling there's no, there's no place for sugar pop, cotton candy vendors. They belong at the fair. They don't belong behind the pulpit. Location matters. Does it matter where Jesus sat? Yeah. The Mount of Olives was a place of rest and prayer. Luke 21 tells us every day Jesus went to the temple to teach and each evening he returned to spend the night on the Mount of Olives. After the Last Supper and before his arrest, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives to pray. Luke 22 tells us then, accompanied by his disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went as usual to the Mount of Olives. I will tell you that there is prophetic significance even from the oil produced from the Mount of Olives. The oil is used throughout Scripture for anointing kings and high priests. Oil from the Mount of Olives was precious, and it was used in the temple activities. Even, even when, um, when, when Samuel went to anoint David the king in 1 Samuel 16, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, talking about David, in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Let me tell you something. You've got oil. You've got the spirit of the Holy Amen. Spirit. Amen. That's your oil. You don't have to go to other people with a little vase. You've got to have a little oil. You're not going to the quick to the Jiffy Lube. You've got oil. The trick is to learn how to, how to activate it, how to move in it, how to pour it out upon others. But what I want you to see is how intentional everything's lining up. You see, Jesus is not just sitting on a hill. You're not just sitting in a chair. You're in the process of being enthroned, of Moshe. You're in the process of stepping into your destiny, your kingdom-defined destiny. 
When you see that Jesus is enthroned as the coming king, in the location outside of the man-made temple that's about to be destroyed, where, where the oil is pressed from the Mount of Olives to anoint him into his position of Lord, you begin to see that there's nothing of karma or coincidence. It is all structured by design. Your life is structured by design. But unless you're willing, unless you're willing to stop sitting on a hill and get up and move into your destiny, you just sit in a cage in a zoo waiting for somebody to buy a ticket for you to perform. Come on, come on, come on. God's calling you to be a wild lion. He came as the lamb. Y'all, he's coming back as a lion. Come on, amen. If this equipping church does anything, it's to impress upon you that we're to move into our lion face. You're going to, whether you ride a horse or not, you're coming back on a white horse. There is prophetic significance of the Mount of Olives. So let me share this with you. I love when real current life goes back to Old Testament. About a month ago, there was a rocket that was launched in the outer space before it came back to Earth. Now, unlike every other rocket that had been launched, and we're old enough to, to remember the, the, the space race, the Russians, Sputnik, and all that stuff. We remember that. But all those rockets, all those efforts, only last month, it was called Starship, the only rocket to launch and return exactly where it first launched. Let me tell you something. You thought the temple was amazing last week? This rocket is 397 feet high. It is 8,102,000 pounds heavy. It travels at 15,534 miles per hour. And it was caught by two mechanical arms called chopsticks to bring it back to the exact location it left. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. So, what if I told you that there was an Old Testament prophet named Zechariah in 520 B.C. without a computer, without AI, without electricity, that old boy didn't even have running water. What if I told you he did the same thing about 2,544 years ago. Would you believe that? You see, this example of, of starship, this is a modern day reliving of what Jesus taught the disciples when they sat across from that beautiful temple. And he said, hey, look, that's cool and all, but don't be too impressed by the things of this world. While admirable, the starship it's not at all close to the category as the miraculous. It, you see, Old Testament prophecies of the end time timeline, you've got to understand them so that believers don't confuse that our goal is not life on Mars, but it's eternal life with Messiah. Amen. Understanding Old Testament prophecy. You see, while Boca Chica, Texas... Yay for Texas. That was actually the place that the ship launched from. Yay for Texas. And it's where it returned. The Mount of Olives is where Jesus ascended. And it's where prophecy says he's going to return. I want to prove it to you. Let's go to the book of Acts. The ascension. Let's say the launch. The launch pad. But you will receive... Now this is Jesus, so we're clear... But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, just like so many experienced this morning. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Y'all will be his witnesses telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Church, I want to ask you, are you sharing the gospel in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth? We got to. Amen. If not us, who? Amen. 
So he continues. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. And they, as they strained to see him rising into the heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken away from you into heaven. But someday, but someday, but someday, he will return from heaven in the what? In the same way you saw him go. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from where? The Mount of Olives. About a half a distance, about a half mile. This, the Mount of Olives, does location matter? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. The Mount of Olives is where Jesus, Moshe, where he was enthroned. The Mount of Olives is where Jesus ascended. You see, in Jesus' launch, the two angels tell that Jesus is going to come back the way he first left. In power, in a cloud, rising into heaven, rose from the Mount of Olives. Matthew 24, 30 tells us that Jesus returns the way he left. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear where? In heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on what? The clouds of heaven. With what? With power and with glory. So how does Jesus return? In power, in a cloud, descending from heaven. Where? Onto the Mount of Olives. What I will tell you? is 570 years before the book of Acts. Zechariah prophesied the exact same location of Jesus' return is the Mount of Olives. Do you see the significance of Old Testament prophecy? Do you see the significance of historical verification of these prophecies? Zechariah 14.4 tells us, On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. When, it, when the Bible talks about his feet, it is the physical presence, but it is the establishment of government. On, this, on that day, Jesus will establish government, governance, the kingdom of God at the Mount of Olives. Amen. Now, you ask, what is that day? That's the way my, think, my mind thinks as a, as a former investigator. That day, what day? We've already talked about it, eschatology. The second coming of Christ is that day. Following the seven-year tribulation, that day, you'll see it in Scripture, that day, the day, or the day of the Lord, that talks about Jesus' return to the earth with the raptured believers at the end of tribulation. So when Zechariah says, on that day, he is talking about the second coming of Christ. This is 570 years before the book of Acts. So you say, well, that's cool. What does it matter to me? Well, I'll tell you, Zechariah's got a word for you too. 14.5 tells us, Then the Lord my God will come and all his holy ones with him. Do you know who will be with Jesus when he returns to stand on the Mount of Olives at his second coming? You. You are part of God's army of raptured believers. You, and Ellie, if you want to come up, this is why it's so important as an equipping church that you know what's going to happen, that you know why it's going to happen, when you know when it's going to happen, and you know who's it going to happen to. I want you to understand that, that when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, a lot of people, oh, I just don't want to float around heaven as a little fat angel playing the harp. You're not. You're not. You're not. This is what you're going to be doing. This is what you're going to be doing. You've got a glorious life. These things, that temple is nothing. That spaceship is nothing. The life we're going to live in eternity is the only thing that is something. You are part of God's army of raptured believers. Amen. So your question should be, well, how do I apply eschatology to my life? Well, I want to encourage you. Live your life with an eternal purpose. Yes. Don't ever let a day just be a day. Don't ever let a text message just be a text message. Don't ever let a lunch just be a lunch. 
Start your day asking the Lord, how can I share Jesus today? How can I share Jesus today? Think about the person that shared Christ with you. The person that brought you out of darkness and led you into salvation. What if that person, the day they shared Christ with you, instead chose for that day just to be another day? Live your life with an eternal purpose. You know, when we talk about the tithe, I want you to see that that offering has an eternal purpose. Live your life with an eternal purpose. Embrace peace over panic. Listen, two days from now, the most important election that the history of this nation has ever experienced is going to go down. I want to ask you, how many of you have been in prayer, have been in intercession, versus the time spent on, on social media and talking to people? You have authority when you're willing to exercise it. Embrace peace over panic. This is how you apply eschatology to your life every day. Grow your spiritual muscles. The Bible encourages you to be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. It takes strength. It takes conviction. It takes resolute to stand firm in the faith. You can stand firm because you got the peace of the Lord. And build your altar. How do I apply this to my life every day? Build your altar. You see, too many of us, like Abram was told, pitch your tent, build your altar. We worry more about building our tent, building our business, building our ministry, building our social media platform, building our ego, building our bank account. Mm -mm. Tents are temporary. When Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me, he was talking to a nomadic group of people. The cross was, the, was the, the center peg to their tent. Pick up your cross and follow me. That tent that they resided in was always meant to be mobile so you could pick up and follow the Lord. Amen. Build your altar. Every day, build your personal relationship with God. Pray, read scripture, become an active part in God's faith community. Amen. Don't just sit on a hill. Don't just sit on a hill. Moshe, you're being enthroned. You're not just here to sit in a chair. And location matters, church. Location matters. Preparing for his return, it means growing in faith and love and trust. And that starts now. See, we always had a thing in special operations. Stay ready so you don't have to get ready. Because in the twinkling of an eye, it is faster than a blink. It cannot even be, um, through physics, quantified how fast the twinkling of an eye is. If you're not ready, it's too late to get ready. You are in the process. You have the authority to walk out your destiny. You are all destined to be kings and priests. So, I want to encourage you, church. The end of these times, they signal the beginning of the best of times. Take joy, take hope in the end of these times. What I will share is that we are going to continue. This is just, this is 13.3 of the scripture. And we got halfway through the sentence. The Lord actually told me on Monday, you sit on the word sat. And that's where I've been all week. If you had to call my house and say, what are you doing? Well, I'm sitting on the word sat. You would have thought I was insane. Until the Holy Spirit begins to reveal his truths. I encourage you to sit on the word of the Lord. If we can stand as the body, and I will pray this, I will pray this time out. The Lord is so good. He gave us beautiful rain, and now he's going to give us some nice humidity. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. If our elders would, would come to the altar. And I know there's still ministry that needs to be had. We are a Bible-believing, Holy Spirit-led church. Our elders are part of our governance. They are strong elders. They are integrity gatekeepers. So I'm going to open the altar for prayer As you, if you come up. I want to make this invitation that if you've not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let today be the day that you make that decision. 
Mm. It is a decision that you get to make. It is not wrapped up in emotion or pressure or stress or peer pressure. It is the it is the mm. it is the conviction of the Holy Spirit pressing on you. So I invite you to to make that decision today. And if you're not comfortable coming up to the altar, then 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 afterwards, let's pray about it. But I don't want you to leave this church the way you came without Jesus as your Savior. I want to make the invitation hmm, that if you need ministry to come up for anything, and you're welcome to come up now for prayer, for intercession, for healing, for deliverance. So Lord, Father, we thank You. Lord, we thank You that that this life we're living, no matter how wonderful the seasons we may be in or we may be coming to, hmm, that this is just a a glimpse of, of the glory to come. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you give us a roadmap with tangible markers and tangible events and a tangible timeline so that we, we're not supposed to be like toddlers at a birthday party gasping when the balloons pop and Googling over presents open. We are called to be an equipped, an equipped, mature body of saints. Thank you for giving us the timeline, the roadmap, So we do know the signs. I pray that as a body, we we take, we take these end times and we see them as hope and joy. So Lord, I, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this body. I thank you for the blessings of tongues. I thank you for the blessing of Holy Spire over young couples. I thank you for reigniting, reigniting, even if it was just an ember. Just blowing. Your Holy Spirit over the smallest of embers. That's what ignites the flames of revival. Lord, we pray for revival. We pray for revival. Lord, I pray that we build our altars. We tend to the embers. We grow the holy, consuming fire of the Lord. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church.